Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. You come to the field of consciousness as an anesthesiologist, uh, which makes perfect sense, uh, although it seems as if there, most people would think of someone studying consciousness should be a philosopher or a psychologist or a neurologist. Tell me about the history of anesthesiology as it pertains to the study of consciousness. Right, well, anesthesia takes away consciousness and then it's restored when you turn the anesthesia off or you get rid of the anesthetic. And it's fairly selective in that under anesthesia, mm -hmm. the brain is quite active. We can record EEG, it just tends to get a little bit slower. We can uh, record evoked potentials. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we do this clinically. So for example, if the surgeon is working on the spine uh, and the neck or the back, uh, we can stimulate from the feet or the arms and record from the brain on the opposite side to make sure that the signals are getting through the spinal cord into the brain. This They're is a surprising finding already. Uh, I mean, most people would probably imagine that if you're out cold under anesthesia that your nervous system is quite Quiet. Correct, and it's quieter, but it's not it's not totally quiet, and it's quite active. The uh, EEG gets slower, as I said, evoke potentials. There's lots of stuff going on, but most of what the brain does is non-conscious anyway. Consciousness is kind of a, a small piece of what the brain does. The most essential piece, probably the most essential thing in the in the universe, is consciousness. It's really all that really matters when you come right down to it. But under anesthesia, consciousness is erased, suspended however you want to describe it, and then it comes back. And uh, it's pretty much, re uh, pretty much reversible, except in some rare circumstances. Mm -hmm. And the field of anesthesia started uh, when? <laughs> the modern era of anesthesia started in the 1800s um, or so with uh, uh, ether and nitrous oxide, which were used originally for social reasons, ether frolics, uh, people figured out that if they, they took a whiff of ether, they got really high and, and jubilant and, and had a great time. Uh, at, at higher doses, they would pass out. And nitrous oxide or laughing gas, mm -hmm. they would breathe. And uh, again, they would have a, feel really good for a short period of time. I know like, William James r reported in varieties of religious experience that he took nitrous oxide, essentially, I guess you'd have to say, for recreational purposes yeah. and yeah. had a quasi-mystical experience. Yes, yes. That's been reported and uh, again uh, uh, it's dose dependent so at certain low doses you are still awake but excited or, or in a mystical state or however you want to describe it and at higher doses you lose consciousness entirely and so that's how it started with either frolics and laughing gas the, the the question is you know how does it work how do uh, how does anesthesia prevent consciousness how yes. does it work in the brain and that's where the scientific aspect of it comes in it's 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 a wonderful clinical tool. Uh, imagine living in a world without anesthesia. If you, if you uh, got in a car accident, broke your leg or anything and required surgery, think of uh, uh, the difference it makes knowing that, okay, I'll go to sleep or they'll give me a spinal, my leg will be numb, I won't feel anything, uh, as opposed to the terror we would live under if anesthesia didn't exist. It's really an amazing discovery. Indeed.